Father, you possess all the glory and the power and the kingdom is yours. We have been studying this kingdom in the Gospel of Mark, Lord, and we long for it to come. We long for it to arrive. We long for you to receive the worship that is due your name from this entire inhabited world. And Lord, as we, as we sing your praises and as we worship you, we are so thankful that we can sing these lyrics that are true. We know that nothing inhibits you. There's nothing that holds you back. There's no one stronger than you. There's no limitation to your power that would prevent your kingdom from coming this very day. Yet here we are in this church age, and we know that your kingdom, in one sense, remains hidden. And in one sense, it remains concealed, because you certainly are saving those who are yours, and you are producing faith in hearts through the preaching of your word, and yet you do not reign personally on earth, and you have not yet begun to reverse the curse as you have promised that you will. And so, as we worship you for your power to bring a kingdom, we pray that, Lord, that we would be kingdom citizens before your kingdom comes. I pray for Grace Bible Church this morning that as we study your word this morning, that this very text would become a means of grace for all of us. We are nothing but sinners saved by your grace. We are your humble slaves, and we long to do your will. And so corporately, Lord, we're crying out to you right now that the preaching of your word and in our response to it, you would produce something in us that we could never take credit for, namely, actual conformity to your will. We pray, Lord, that you would make us more and more like Christ, that our holiness might be more eminent and obvious, that the manifestation of kingdom power would be in our Christ-likeness as we, as we live uh, throughout the week and in all of our relationships and in all of our responsibility, Lord, that our lives would be completely conformed to your will. And so, Lord, you know my own prayer to preach your word faithfully. It's also our prayer in this moment that we would listen faithfully. Give us ears to hear so that you would be glorified by our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. You may take a seat, and uh, I want to invite you to grab your copy of Scripture and open up to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. We're going to dive back into this text that we've been studying and I want to just begin by directing your attention to something that you probably don't often think about, and that is the human ear. I don't know when the last time you thought about your ears really was. Maybe it was this morning. You had some shaving cream on your ears. I don't know. I'm not talking no, about your physical ear. I'm talking about the miracle of hearing. Now, have you ever thought about how incredible it is, the, the entire process of hearing? I mean, this is something that we maybe I should say I, I don't know, maybe you, you might not be included in that way, but I often take for granted. And on a day like a Sunday where we get to hear the word preached, there's something that happens every time there's communication and conversation that is so miraculously, namely hearing. I mean, think about this for a second. Right now, you're hearing my voice. So sound waves are traveling through the sanctuary. They're hitting your ear, and then something happens so that you're actually thinking about what I'm saying. And if you're actually listening to what I'm saying right now, you're thinking about the miracle of hearing. And that's just incredible that me, talking, me saying something up here is causing that reaction in your brain. Well, what is this something that's happening between my speech and those sound waves hitting your ear and then your actual contemplation of the process of hearing? Well, that's... That's in God's design of what happens in this organ called the ear. Um, you might remember that there's an outer ear, there's a middle ear, there's an inner ear. What's fascinating about this is the outer ear not only consists of the part that you see, the, the, the pinna, but it also includes the ear canal. That's actually part of the outer ear, the external ear canal. It's approximately an inch long and it's a, a third of an inch 
wide, and it's interesting, this is the perfect diameter for resonance of the human voice. And uh, there's glands in the skin that produce um, wax, which actually protect the ear. It protects the ear um, from infection. It protects the ear from skin cells dying off and, and uh, preventing hear, uh, the sound waves from traveling through the ear canal. And so your outer ear, the part that you actually see, is perfectly formed by God to channel sound waves into the ear canal, which is perfectly designed by God to uh, reverberate, to produce the resonance for a human voice and for these sound waves to make it to your middle ear. And then the middle ear starts with the eardrum. The eardrum is a watertight seal between the ear canal and the middle ear, and uh, it responds to these sound waves, which are being channeled through your outer ear. The eardrum itself is nine millimeters in diameter. That's a third of an inch. And it's 0.075 millimeters thick. Um, if you doubt that, I measured it this morning, so don't question my stats there. No, I'm, I'm relying pretty heavily. I'm pretty much cutting and pasting from a book called The Earbook by Thomas Balcony and Kevin Brown. It's published by John Hopkins. But uh, you don't have to rely, you know, trust my expertise uh, on, on my knowledge of the inner and middle and outer ear. I'm, I'm just quoting from these guys. But it was fascinating when I read that. I thought, man, that's just a tiny little membrane. It is covered with some skin, and it's a, it's a fibrous uh, um, tissue with tiny blood vessels inside of it. At the begin at the. Uh, eardrum, the eardrum actually takes the sound waves and begins to vibrate, and it's, it's, it vibrates the hammer, and it's actually the opposite of a, of a drum. We heard drums this morning, so if you think of a stick on a snare or, uh, you know, some sort of mallet or a percussionist playing a timpani, well, the hammer, you would imagine the hammer would be beating the eardrum, but it's actually the opposite. The eardrum is reverberating, and it's vibrating, and it causes the hammer to vibrate, and the hammer is the first of three bones in the middle ear. The other two are the anvil and then the stirrup. And these are the smallest bones in the human body. They actually are, they have muscles on them which can dampen the sound in extremely loud uh, circumstances. So if you think of going to some concert, you, they can actually dampen the sound so you don't do as much damage, maybe some damage. Together, the, uh, the eardrum and the middle ear bones amplify sound about 26 times before delivering it to your inner ear. So now, as the stirrup vibrates, it starts to pass on these vibrations to the inner ear, and the inner ear is composed of two parts, the cochlea and the balance system, and we'll just ignore the balance for a second, because that doesn't have anything to do with Mark IV. But as, as far as inner ear goes, the cochlea is about one centimeter across. It looks like a nautilus shell, and it has um, three fluid-containing compartments arranged in a spiral, and there are, get this, 15,000 hair cells in each cochlea, and these are moved um, by the vibrations of the inner ear fluid. So that inner ear fluid is taking the, the, the vibrations being passed through the middle ear, and it's causing the, the fluid to move, and these 15,000 cells, each chamber, so 45,000 hair cells, uh, in, in, picking up that, that shaking of the fluid, and it transmits that to the brain. So your inner ear is what's trans, transmitting a vibration into a, a neurological effect that passes the signal to the brain through your neurons. How do you know if someone's listening? And have you ever had one of those moments where you in a moment of sheer genius, have the greatest joke ever known to mankind, and you deliver it with perfect deliver and delivery, and the person just stares at you? <laughs> and you're thinking, well, I got two options here. Either, <laughs> either I'm right, and that's the greatest joke ever told, and uh, they're not listening, or it was a bad joke. Well, which one is it? Sometimes it's hard to know if somebody listening or not. I mean, think about, you know, preaching. I learned a long time ago to not judge um, whether somebody is listening by, by their response. Uh, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes people uh, have like this, this look, I like to call it the, you know, the screensaver look. It's just like, it's just like you're, you're kind of wondering, is there anything, an incognitive, an incognitive happening there? And you know, you, you, you see somebody, and I'm not thinking of any of you, I'm thinking of other congregations. Um, <laughs> 
And you know, I, you look at somebody, you're thinking like, are they even paying attention? And sometimes you talk to somebody who had the appearance of screensaver mode for an entire sermon, and then they're just like, that was incredible. I thought about this implication. Here's this truth, and here's this implication. And you're like, wow, they were listening. And then there's other people who, I'm, I'm convinced like their screensaver mode is this. <laughs> and then you talk to them afterwards, and you're like, oh, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know you were preaching. Like, what was the, I don't even know what the sermon was about. And it's just interesting how difficult it can be to know is someone listening. Uh, in this book that I was looking at this last week, the ear book, I was reading about troubleshooting um, hearing. And uh, in their physical hearing, it's interesting, they, they have tests, you know, you have two major categories for hearing loss. One's conductive, and that would be something wrong in the outer or middle ear, and something's not transferring, it's something's blocking the transmission of those sound waves. Or sensorineural, which would be a deafness, because the inner ear is actually not translating those sound waves that are getting there to the neurons. And so those are two, two ways that they have to look and, and troubleshoot uh, where the loss in hearing really comes from. Now, fortunately, you didn't come here this morning to troubleshoot your physical hearing. But we certainly do need to devote our attention this morning to a text that is going to help us troubleshoot our spiritual hearing. I pray that you are ready to consider and evaluate your spiritual listening ability, your spiritual hearing, your spiritual receptivity, your spiritual perception, your spiritual discernment, your ability to receive the word rightly. And this is what Jesus highlights in this short and very unique paragraph. We come to this paragraph, we're in, in Mark chapter 4, verses 21 to 25, and, and this is, is absolutely a, a, a paragraph in Scripture that is without parallel. To be technically precise, almost every one of these verses contains phrases that you can find Jesus saying elsewhere in his earthly ministry. But to be perfectly honest, there's nowhere else in Scripture that compile, where, where Jesus said all of this to prove this particular point. And so some of these might be common axioms, common word pictures, word plays that Jesus has used in other contexts. It's really only here where we have this paragraph recorded in such a uh, punchy and succinct fashion where Jesus was using some obviously familiar word pictures to put them together into this lesson for us to consider how do we listen? If I can offer one more parallel before we dive in, one more parallel between physical hearing and spiritual listening. When it comes to our physical hearing, sometimes we might imagine that uh, hearing loss or damage is only being done to our hearing when we experience um, pain in our ears, and that's a myth. In fact, it's interesting, I, I read this week, some damage can even occur at 85 decibels, but pain won't really be noted until right around 110 decibels. And so I thought about the interesting dynamic that we can actually do damage to our physical hearing before we experience pain in our ears. And I thought how, how interesting that spiritually speaking, as we're going to learn, especially in verses 24 and 25 this morning, that we can actually damage our spiritual hearing and we might not be sensitive to it. We can actually hurt our ability to hear Christ speak we can do damage to our spiritual receptivity. And the question becomes, how do we know whether we listen well or not? How do I know if my, if my listening is, is good? What standard do I use to evaluate how well do I listen to God when he speaks in his word? The test is not whether we take notes it's not whether we nod our head during a sermon or give the proverbial mmm at a really poignant part of the sermon. Not that that's wrong. It's not even whether we can recite texts. The test of whether we listen is are our lives becoming conformed to God's will? If we are hearing with spiritual ears, if we are hearing with spiritual receptivity, 
the mark of proper listening will not be seen in the moment. It will be seen in the life. A life will become increasingly like Christ. It will become increasingly holy, increasingly humble, increasingly sensitive to everything that God has said. And so are our lives being conformed to God's will? That is the spiritual test of proper spiritual hearing. Let me read the paragraph, Mark chapter 4, picking up at verse 21, and we're going to read all the way through verse 25. Follow along as I read. And he was saying to them, a lamp is not brought to be put under a basket, is it? Or under a bed? Is it not brought to be put on a lampstand? For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been secret, but that it would come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he was saying to them, take care what you listen to. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you, and more will be given you besides. For whoever has, to him more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he has, shall be taken away from him. This is a powerful paragraph. It's honestly, it's one of my favorites in the entire gospel of Mark because I know that it has been an incredible ministry to my own heart as I have looked at a, my own heart and realized how much spiritual hearing loss I have incurred. I'm going to steal a phrase from Solomon, and I'm going to say, we could paraphrase this. I I titled the sermon, Watch What You Hear. But if I used, if I let Solomon title the sermon, we might say, above all else, guard your ears. Watch out how you hear. Watch what you hear. In fact, that's exactly what verse 24 says. Take care, and it's the word beware. It's literally a command. Watch, look. Watch what you hear. Now, if we, do, if we look at this um, paragraph, as I mentioned, there's a lot of familiar phrases here. And as you read this paragraph, as you followed along as I read it, you probably saw a lot of phrases that were very familiar. Um, for instance, in verse 21, we, we see this analogy, this word picture of a lamp being hidden under a basket or under a bed. We see that exact same word picture being used in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, this is not the Sermon on the Mount. This is a different context. In fact, in Matthew's parallel, this, this would be occurring in chapter 13. So in, in, in Matthew's gospel, which is very chronological, you go all the way back to the Sermon on the Mount. He's using that word picture, but he's doing something different with it. In Matthew 5, verse 15, he says... Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Now, in in Matthew 5, Jesus is preaching a sermon about kingdom citizenship, and he's describing what it looks like to live worthy of the kingdom, and he's describing true kingdom citizenship. And he's explaining that for somebody to follow Christ and to be a true kingdom citizen, their life should be so distinct from the world that they shine like a light and they are salty like salt on the table. They would season everything else around it. And so there's a distinctiveness to the life of a Christian that can't be hidden. There's a saltiness to the Christian that does not become insipid. And so it's talking about the power of a transformed life And so it's the exact same word picture, but it's used in a different context, and it's kind of carrying a different weight, doing different work, even though it's the same same reality. In verse 22, you probably are familiar with that that phrase there, um, uh, concealing and uncovering. In fact, we see a parallel in Matthew chapter 10, verse 26. And again, Matthew 10 is three chapters before Matthew 13, which is the parallel to Mark 4, the parable of the kingdom um, the kingdom, uh, the mysteries of the kingdom is Matthew 13. So three chapters before that, Jesus is using the same word picture of verse 22, and he says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 26, therefore do not fear them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be made known. And he's talking about not fearing those who only have the power to kill your body. He says, don't fear them. What can they do? They can just kill you. Big whoop. Fear the person who can not only kill your body, but put your soul in hell. Fear God. And so in that context, 
the covering and uncovering uh, issue is that the hostility of the world against Christians might happen in secret, but it's going to be uncovered. All, everything will be brought to justice. And so again, same word picture in Matthew chapter 10, verse 26, but it's in a totally different context to Mark chapter 4. Similarly in verse 23, Uh, That's also found in Matthew chapter 11, verse 15. That's found all over the place. But in Matthew chapter 11, verse 15, it's talking about he who has ears to hear in the context of choosing to welcome the truth of the gospel and accept John the Baptist as the prophet Elijah. And so Jesus, again, can use very familiar phrases, familiar word pictures, familiar analogies in all sorts of different contexts. Verse 24 is echoed in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, verse 2. But there he's talking about um, a measurement that we would use to evaluate whether we judge a brother in a horizontal context. Here, he's using that same word picture to talk about a standard of measure of how we regard how well we listen to his word. And so, you know, we could go through this paragraph and we could say, man, Jesus has said all of these things all over his earthly ministry. But as I showed you, all of those four contexts are radically different contexts. And it was actually interesting. So many commentators come to Mark chapter 4, verses 21 to 25, and they they really miss the richness of what Jesus says here because they, some of them, just perhaps because of just a poor view of Scripture, they imagine that Mark is just assembling this anthology of best of quotes and just saying, hey, here's a really cool paragraph. Let me just throw that in here. Mark is not doing that. Mark is telling us exactly what Jesus said. Jesus knows exactly what he's saying. He's preaching with perfection. And this paragraph here has something to contribute uh, to the understanding of the parables. And we already saw that the parable of the soils is preeminently a parable about listening. And it's a parable about the state of the heart when the word comes. And so now he's going to talk about how important it is to watch how we listen. It's imperative that we take Mark's text at face value and we let the context determine what Jesus is saying here. This is not a random assortment. This is absolutely, it's spoken here in this context. And the only question comes is, was this spoken to the public, to the multitudes, or was this spoken to the disciples? And let me give you just three reasons. I think this was spoken to the, to the public. I think it was spoken to the multitude uh, that, that you see in chapter 4, verse um, Two, he was teaching them many things in parables, and he was saying, saying to them in his teaching, listen, behold, the sower went out to sow. And so in, there you see that he's preaching publicly to this great multitude. In chapter 4, verse 1, it's called a large crowd, this very large crowd. So the parable was told publicly, and then as we saw in chapter 4, verse 10, all the way through 20, he's speaking privately to his, his followers. That includes the 12, and that includes all of those who are followers, the insiders, those who are believing Christ, and they want to know more about what he said. They want, to, they want to hear with understanding. He discloses to them the meaning of the parables. And so here in chapter 4, verse 21... Mark switches. He goes back to kind of the the background uh, of the story, and he tells us some more information we need to know about how what he explained to the the disciples in verses uh, thirteen to twenty. And so he switches back to that same same tense that he uses to tell all the rest of chapter four. And so really, it uh, puts it in the same category as everything else that was told publicly. Secondly, and the other reason why I think this is spoken publicly is because in verse. Three, and then again in verse 9, we have the charge to listen. The command in verse 3 is, listen to this. In verse 9, he was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then in chapter, 20, uh, chapter 4, verse 23, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And so he keeps reminding them that you must listen. It's, you're ob- obligated to listen. And he's conditioning it on having ears that hear. And so this would make sense that this would also be a public charge to the multitude. Basically an invitation to become an insider, an invitation to come get explanation, an invitation to come get more understanding and to uh, not squander the privilege of understanding the meaning of these parables. Third reason is because in verse 21 to 25, if you read it without Mark 4, it would be so difficult to make sense of. 
It's very enigmatic. It's told just like the parables because there's not a lot of explanation and we actually need the explanation of the parable to make sense of verses 21 to 25. It reads, it matches 426 to 29 and, and verses 30 to 32. It's concealed language, it's parabolic language. And so this would have been something that was told to the multitude. Verse 21, let's pick it up, pick it up and let's dive in and look at these details. He starts by asking them two questions. The first one expects a negative answer. The second one expects a positive answer. Notice what he says. A lamp is not brought to be put under a basket, is it? Or under a bed? And the answer is obviously no. I mean, we understand the, the, the obvious point of this, this question. When he says lamp, what would have come to their minds was a clay terrapata um, ter- terracotta lamp. It would have been filled with oil, set with a wick, and you could light it. You could lengthen the wick, shorten the wick to make it brighter or more dim. But you wouldn't go to all the work of pouring oil into the lamp and then lighting that wick if you were just going to place it under a basket. The word basket is the Greek modion, which would have been a, a peck measure. And if you don't know what that was, how can I even explain it? I, I didn't know what that was. I looked it up. So it's two point, um, or 8.75 liters, 2.3 gallons, so you just picture like maybe two milk jugs or, uh, or like a milk jug size, you know, just like a little, little basket and just cover up that lamp with this basket. What would that do? Nothing. It's pointless. You go to all the work to light the lamp and you put it under this, this bed and the word is, it's used as a cot, a stretcher, a pallet. It's even used for uh, where you would recline at the dining room table. So imagine going to all of that work to light this lamp and put it under a basket, to put it under a bed, to put it under a cot. It would not illumine anything in the room. One time I illustrated this to my boys. Why, um, I, put, I took their trash can, which was, which was solid metal, and I put it over the light in the ceiling and then flipped the switch and it made no difference. Like, okay, is the light on or off? I don't know, flipping it. It's pointless. It's absolutely pointless. Imagine, imagine the, a conversation taking place. We're going camping, son. Make sure you bring the flashlight. But when you turn it on, make sure you cover it so close that no light gets out. What's the point? Of course you don't do that. And second question isn't it brought to be put on the lampstand? Don't you go to all the work, pouring the oil, putting the wick in, to put it on a lampstand so that it actually illumines the room, so that there's actually a point, it actually accomplishes something? Isn't that the whole point? The issue here, of course, is Jesus is still speaking in parables. And as we saw um, several weeks ago, if you go back to verses 10 through 12, he told his disciples privately, as soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the 12, began asking him about the parables. And he was saying to them, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who, those who are outside, get everything in parables. So that while seeing, they may not see. I'm sorry, while seeing, they may see and not perceive. And while hearing, they may hear and not understand. Otherwise, they might return and be forgiven. The issue here is that Jesus is actually teaching about mysteries of the kingdom. He is actually communicating truth about the kingdom that couldn't be known unless he chose to reveal it. And so he is actually revealing something here, but it is concealed and it's concealed from the outsiders, and it is judicial because they have not responded. And it's also gracious because they have not responded. But he still has truth to reveal to the insiders, and so he does it through parables. And so the point here is that Jesus is making this question about why would, in other words, you could ask the question, why, why are you even speaking, Jesus? Why are you even talking? Nobody talks so that the truth would never be made known, so that tr- communication never happens. You talk so that communication actually does happen. And so in the context of parables, he's kind of asking the question, so what's the point here? And if, if we're going to benefit from this paragraph, 
I would encourage you to consider what it means to, to watch what you hear. I would encourage you to consider what it means to, above all else, guard your ears. And, and the first thing we need to do, for, especially from verse 21 to 23, is we need to, to, consider, to consider the nature of revelation. The nature of revelation. Jesus is revealing truth in a concealed manner here because truth has already been rejected by the masses. And so he asks the question in verse 21 to remind us there is a purpose to his communication. Don't forget that at all. But to really understand why he's asking the question, we need to go to verse 22 because verse 22 starts with the word for, and this really explains it. It explains why Jesus is pointing out that these parables are being spoken. He is going to put truth on the lampstand, even though now it is hidden, even though now it is concealed from the masses. Verse 22 explains, For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been secret, but that it would come to light. This is an interesting verse. One commentator said, Truth is hidden in order to be manifested, Concealment intends disclosure. And, and that is just hard for us to get our minds around. What in the world? I mean, let's start with this, this question. What is being referred to here? What is being concealed and what is being revealed? Well, we saw from verses 10 through 12 that what's being concealed and revealed is, are the secrets of the kingdom, the mysteries of the kingdom. Christ is clearly concealing truth about the kingdom in order to manifest those truths. That's just opposite of us. I mean, if we're trying to conceal something, you know, no, nobody, think about it this way, nobody buries incriminating evidence under the ground. I mean, you, you put it under the ground so that it'll never be uncovered. You're, you're trying to conceal something, like, I hope this never gets exposed. And Jesus is sitting here concealing something so that something could be revealed. And the word here is actually buried. It's the same word that you could use for being buried. It's something covered. It's something hidden. Jesus is speaking in such a way that only the insiders will truly hear. So truth is being concealed from those who are not going to listen with ears to hear. They're not going to believe it. But the question then becomes, in verse 22, when he talk, starts talking about the, the, after the concealing, the revealing, or the hiding and the uncovering, or the making secret and bringing something to light, in this transition, when he starts talking about something being brought to light or being manifest, some, some commentators might, they actually take it as, this is a, a preaching of truth when the disciples preach the gospel after his resurrection. And I just, I just don't think that's, that's the right direction here. It doesn't make sense to me because in the context, there's a couple problems with this. Number one, this doesn't really explain the necessity of concealing. In other words, why couldn't Jesus, Jesus has already been preaching openly for three chapters. Chapters one, two, and three. He's not concealing anything. He's not speaking in parables. He's not concealing anything from the general populace. Everybody's getting open, clear, unashamed preaching from Jesus Christ. And so now he starts to conceal it. And if he's going to hand off that truth, which he is going to, and he did at Pentecost, he's going to hand off that truth and even more through the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the apostles to preach the truth during the church age. Why is that? Why does that require Christ to conceal truth? It just, just doesn't make sense to me. The second problem with this interpretation is even stronger. The focus on proclamation is not the context. The context here Jesus is talking about is not preaching the truth, but listening to the truth, receiving the truth, hearing the word of God. What Jesus is doing is he's concealing light through the parables so that the kingdom will only be manifested in this secret fashion of kingdom citizens responding with ears that hear even before the kingdom is manifest. How profound is this? If you read the Old Testament, you're not going to find this type of manifestation of the kingdom. When you read the Old Testament, you have a description of what it means for a divine Messiah to show up as an actual man and rule over the earth in global fashion as the son of David. Reverse of the curse and reign of righteousness. And here he comes and he's rejected and there's no visible manifestation of the kingdom. 
Of course, personally and locally, he's reversing the curse, and that's just in his nature. He's healing. But he, there's no global dominion. Caesar is still on the throne. The secrets of the kingdom are, you know what's going to happen? It's only going to be manifest as people hear my word with faith. And truth was concealed from the populace, but you're going to see a response by faith. And there's going to be a response of some who hear with ears to hear. And they're going to actually live out my Father's will even when I'm not here on earth reversing the curse. That's a secret of the kingdom. That's a mystery of the kingdom. That's a mystery that was not revealed in the Old Testament. That's new to the New Testament. And that's why he's concealing in order to reveal. So he appropriately ends that section by saying, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Or even better, he must hear. It's, an, it's a third person imperative. He must hear. If anyone has ears to hear, he must hear. You must listen. You must listen well. These truths have been concealed so that they could be believed. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this. He said, we are told that men ought not to preach without preparation. Granted. But, we add, men ought not to hear without preparation. Which, think you, needs the most preparation, the sower or the ground? I would have the sower come with clean hands, but I would have the ground well plowed and harrowed, well turned over, and the clods broken before the seed is cast in. It seems to me that there is more preparation needed by the ground than by the sower, more by the hearer than the preacher. Why are professing Christians so adept at enjoying access and exposure to the word of God, the gospel, the revelation of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, while at the same time it seems that professing Christians can be so anemic when it comes to fruitful living and clear articulation of that same truth? I'll tell you exactly why. I fear that the American church is far too comfortable ignoring this paragraph. To watch out, to take care, to be on guard about how we listen to his word. What does it look like? Well, I'll remind you of what we looked at back in chapter 3. Who are his, who are his family? His father, his, mo his mother, his, and his brothers, and his sisters— in verse 35, chapter 3, verse 35, whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. How do you listen? Look and see if your life is being conformed to his image. And so, if we're going to guard our ears well, we need to consider the nature of revelation. God opens eyes, he opens ears, he conceals, he reveals. It's his prerogative. That's the nature of of revelation. Now, secondly, we need to look at the nature of reception. And this is so helpful. Look at verse 24 and 25, the nature of reception. What does it actually mean to receive the truth? What does it actually mean to receive the word, to re the, receive the message of the kingdom? In verse 24, it picks up, he says, Mark writes, and he was saying to them, take care what you listen to. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you and more will be given you Besides, watch out what you hear. And this is a charge about content, but not just content, but actually the manner in which we listen. There's a parallel in Luke chapter 8, verse 18, and it literally would sound like this. Therefore, watch out how you hear. And that's, that's literally what's written in the, in the Greek. And those are synonymous when we remember that Jesus is using the word here in its typical sense, including faith, persuasion, submission, and obedience. This is not just watch out what kind of information goes into your ears. It's watch out what you actually obey. Watch out what you actually listen to. Watch out what you actually actually do with the message of God when you hear it, when you receive it. In other words, hear means not just to have possession of the content of truth, but it means to receive it, to embrace it. 
Now look at verse 24, and I, I, this is, there's some interesting phrases here, and, and these, these, this requires a little bit of explanation. 24a is straightforward. It's very obvious what it means to watch out what we listen to. But then he says this. Jesus says, by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you, and more will be given you besides. So by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. So he's picturing his audience hearing this message, and he's telling us, and let's just put ourselves right there. I mean, we are the audience right here this morning, hearing and studying this text. Jesus Christ is actually saying to us this morning, by the standard of measure we have, all of us put ourselves in this category, whatever standard of measure we have, by that same standard, it's going to be measured back to us. So before we even consider what a standard for what, we should know that whatever our standard is, is going to be repaid to us. We're going to get back something in an equivalent fashion to what our standard is. Now, obviously, in the context, we know he's talking about listening. He just said it in, verse, in 24a. Take care of what you listen to. Watch out how you hear. The standard of measure here is what we consider to be quality listening. What does it mean to actually listen and to listen well? What does it mean to hear God's word? What standard do I use to measure? So if I were to evaluate my own listening, and I'm going to consider, well, how did I listen? Whatever criteria I use, the, the severity of criteria that I use to measure how well I listen to God's word is the actual measure that God is going to use to repay back to me. This is interesting. This starts to already whet our appetites to listen better, listen harder, to listen gooder. <laughs> Whatever we have to tell you say it. I want my listening to be the best because I want the blessing, I want the insight, I want the perception, I want, I want the understanding that God would give me from it. And how can I say that? Well, look at verse 25. Verse 25 again explains verse 24. So verse 24 by itself would be a little bit enigmatic, but verse 25 starts to explain it. The challenge, though, is as soon as I turn to verse 25, you're going to hear another slightly enigmatic phrase. And so you might initially, at initial reading, you might read verse 25 and say, well, that doesn't help. I'm still kind of asking. Now I'm asking the question, what, is, what does verse 25 mean? But let's just dive in real quick, and then we'll connect it to 24. So verse 25, Jesus says, for whoever has, to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Okay, that, that, that is notably enigmatic until we read it in context. Because the question then we're all asking is, we have to identify the haves and the have-nots. And so, who are the haves and the have-nots? Or, or better, what, have what and not have what? What's the object of what we have? What's in possession that's being discussed here by Jesus in verse 25? And he's already said it explicitly in verse 23. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So have what? Ears to hear! So just take the object of verse 23 and put it back into verse 25 because it's, it's ellipted in verse 25. So notice what Jesus is saying in verse 25. Whoever has ears to hear, to him more shall be given. And do it again. And whoever does not have ears to hear, even what he has will be taken away. You see what Jesus is saying now? There are people who have ears to hear. And people who have ears to hear, hear the truth and embrace it and they welcome it with all of its conviction, with all of its exposure, with all of its indictment of, of, of anything in me that is not yet conformed to the image of Christ. I want that. And for that individual, whatever their standard is of what it means to listen to God's word, that same standard is taken and God uses that standard to dispense insight and blessing, spiritual perception, receptivity. Why can, how do I say that? Because in verse 25b, it says the corollary opposite. Notice, whoever does not have 
even what he has. Well, whoever does not have what? Whoever does not have ears to hear, then even what he has will be taken away from him? I thought he didn't have. Well, yeah, but he doesn't have ears to hear. So even what he does have by way of a potential spiritual hearing, even that's going to be taken away from him. So do you realize somebody can hear truth, somebody can be exposed to truth, somebody can take notes on a sermon, somebody can memorize text, but not listen, not change their ways, not submit, not repent, not obey, not be persuaded by that truth. And what happens as consequence, spiritual deafness starts to incur. We incur spiritual damage. My ears become less sensitive. My hearing is diminished because I'm exposed to more truth and I'm doing nothing with it. This is a dangerous place to be. It's a terrifying place to be. It's, it's an occupational hazard for any of us who study God's word. To become casual and complacent or to start to evaluate our standard of how we're listening based upon information and recitation of texts and insights and parsing of verbs and paying attention to syntax and grammar and details that can flatter our flesh to think that we have heard God speak, but we might be excusing disobedience. You know, there's a lot of things in life that I enjoy, and sometimes I find myself not counting the cost to take the time that it would take to enjoy them. I, uh, I enjoy, uh, I'm, I'm an I'm a, I'm a amateur coffee roaster. I enjoy roasting coffee, and sometimes, you know, it's like, hey, a fresh cup of coffee, that sounds kind of good, but to go make my own roast, that's, that just takes too long. It's not worth it. I like liege waffles. I literally have never made one in my entire life. My wife has made every single liege waffle, except in liege, Belgium. Uh, she's made every other liege waffle I've ever made. I don't have time to wait for dough to rise. It just takes too long. You might think, well, how, how bad do you like it? How bad do you want it? And that's the whole point, isn't it? How bad do I want to hear God's word? How zealous am I to listen with ears to hear. One commentator said, what you get out of Jesus' parables depends on what you put in. That's exactly right. Another commentator said, those who are on the outside, they resist God's word, they dig themselves into a deeper hole of ignorance further and further from God and his grace. As judgment on their refusal to hear and obey, they lose what ability they have left to hear. Listen, friends, do not, do not be what we might call a hyper-Calvinist when it comes to listening. What do I mean by that? Somebody who just says, oh, well, God's sovereign. He opens eyes and he opens ears, and so if I'm going to hear, then I'll just let God open my ears. No, God is sovereign, and he's sovereignly told us to get after taking care with how we listen. He's told us that it's up to us to determine a high standard of measure of what it means to be responsible with the truth that he spoke. And in fact, what's so powerful about verse 24 is not only are we going to receive spiritual receptivity and are we going to receive an increasing ability to hear based on our standard of measurement, it says we, it will actually be given more besides. So if we have a high standard of what it means to listen to God's word, we actually get more. The blessing is exponential if we have ears to hear. Doesn't that just make you want to listen to God, God's word with perfection? Doesn't that just beg your soul to just scrap every, every area in your soul that would not be conformed to God's will yesterday? We get exponential blessing, exponential sensitivity, exponential receptivity to his word. Listen, the point is, the point of this parable is, is, is this paragraph is really simple. There's no such thing as flatlining when it comes to spiritual hearing. No one's hearing is, is static when, it's, when we're talking about spiritual ears. Your hearing is either getting better or worse. No one has ever flatlined. If you're hearing it with ears to hear, it's getting better. If not, you're losing what you had. 
how do we watch what we hear? I'll be really quick on this. Um, I just want to give you some practical thoughts. How do you watch what you hear? Very practical here. Starting in number one, minimize audio pollution. I was thinking about this the last several, last few months, really, just studying Mark 4. The amount of static interference, competing noise, opposing voices, foreign messages that come at us in our culture, especially with digital media that we have access to, it's like a, it's like a constant tinnitus, constant ringing in our ears, distracting us from what we should be listening to. Just start minimizing audio pollution. Number two, scrutinize every other voice. Scrutinize every other voice. If you don't want to lose discernment, whatever enters your ears, and again, I'm talking about spiritually, whatever enters your spiritual ears, whatever wavelength that's going into your spiritual hearing, you must scrutinize it biblically. Put it through a biblical grid. You have to label what you're hearing spiritually as truth or error, or you're going to lose discernment. Number three, discipline your ears. Discipline your ears. Uh, We live in a digital world where it's really a digital addiction. I mean, have you ever noticed how you know, you, you, you have to go buy something uh, on, online, and then the next thing you know, every ad has to do with whatever. It's like, I bought a pair of socks two weeks ago, and now socks are showing up on everything in my, you know, wherever I go on the internet. It's like, the, 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 all this digital media is geared towards us and our, our desires and what we want. And so here we are, we have opportunity to hear whatever we want. Not only do we have opportunity to hear whatever we want, whatever we want is thrown at us by way of algorithms on the internet. We have to discipline our ears. In fact, I came across one study that said the average adult attention span is eight seconds. And so when we live in a world where everything is customized according to our own selfish desires, how much attention does it take to pay attention to something that's indicting us, let alone not flattering us? Most importantly here, we start to get to numbers four through six. Number four, how do we watch what we hear? Number four, obey every word already heard. Obey every word already heard. You know, if you or I, if, most, if, if you've been at this church for any length of time, you or I have our hands full with obeying what we already know, don't we? We, we have our hands full. Don't fall prey to the lie of prioritizing commands in order to neglect other ones or taking pride in some area where we, you know, our bosom sin from pre-conversion and we just kind of keep hanging on that, but meanwhile we're excusing compromise in other areas. That'll ruin your ability to hear. Number five, obey every word you will hear. Come to God's word willing to hear something you've never heard before. Lord, who can discern his hidden faults? Keep me from presumptuous sin, David prays in Psalm 19. And so come to God's word knowing there's still still sin I haven't even seen yet. God's still revealing more and more areas where I've not yet conformed to Christ's image. Come to his word ready to hear that. Number six, hate every violation. Look, Josiah tore his garments when the law was discovered and he realized that the nation had not obeyed his word. He says in 2 Kings 22, verse 13, our fathers have not listened to the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. And he tore his, he tore his garments. If you want to Listen and listen well. If you want to guard your heart and watch your ears above all else so that you keep hearing spiritually, hate every manifestation where you have not listened well to his word. Believer, consider this positive and negative in verse 25. If you have ears to hear, your spiritual insight's increasing. If you do not, then the more exposure to the truth, it's only... It's only hurting your spiritual receptivity. And don't evaluate whether you listen well by a response to the word 10 years ago, uh, let alone last year. Evaluate your listening by how well you are currently obeying God's will. Father, we thank you so much for this reminder to watch what we hear. And we come before you just asking that you would indeed answer our prayer from the beginning. That that would be true of us as a congregation, and that's going to require it to be true of every, every member of Grace Bible Church. We, we long to be those 
who hear and who hear well. Lord, perhaps, um, perhaps it's appropriate as we close our time in, the, in this singing your, your praises, perhaps it's appropriate to quiet our hearts for a moment and just to acknowledge, Lord, um, anywhere that we have not conformed to your will, where we have known your will, well, that, that's, a, that's no doubt a stubbornness. And that, no doubt, is a direct reflection of a very low standard of what it means to listen well. Lord, thank you for this incredible, incredible reminder. I pray as your children that our standard of measure would have been, have grown exponentially just simply from looking at this text, and it's going to require conviction for that to play out. Lord, give us the faith. Give us the faith to count the cost, that we would raise the bar on what it means to hear your word, on what it means to listen to you. Perhaps as we've talked even about compromises that would diminish our spiritual hearing, and perhaps some are even aware that there might be, there might be radical decisions that need to be made this very week, if not even this very moment, so that we would listen and listen well. Lord, there's just nothing more important than how well we listen to your word. And so we just pray that you would give us ears to hear, that you would strengthen our desire to have the highest possible standard of what it means to truly listen to your word, and that we would live with the eyes of faith. I pray, Lord, that we would even believe what Pastor Smed has taught us this morning in the equipping hour, that we would look forward to see a reward, a reward based on the foundation of truth, based upon our labors, based upon our fidelity, not even based upon our fruit. So Lord, help us to tirelessly work and labor to listen well. Cultivate in us true humility, true holiness, true Christ-likeness, so that a watching phoenix would see a church full of Christians, little Christs, who live distinct, who live salty and brilliant lives, flavorful and totally distinct from the world that has no power over lust or pride, selfishness or laziness that they would live for your glory. So Lord, thank you again for this reminder, and we just pray that you'd be honored as we sing this song to you and to your glory. In your name we pray, amen.